Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to check out the Hornet King channel. In this video, I'm going to be showing you guys the removal process of two ball face hornet nests. One that I relocated from a client's house in Lancaster City, PA, that I brought back to my house and mounted it to the window of my barn so that way I could see all the activity inside the nest as it grows. And the other one is a removal from a client's house that was unable to be relocated. So I brought it back to my house and I tweezed out a lot of the larvae. So I'm able to show you guys the stages of larvae along with the pupating adults all the way up to adulthood. So here's the video guys, check it out. So this is an aerial nest building yellow jacket, Dolica Vespula maculata, also known as bald-faced hornet. So this queen had decided to build her colony on the side of this window sash, and this is on the south side of the house, and it's apartment building, and it is on like right above a kind of like a little like off rooftop. So there's like a little balcony there, but this rooftop was co covered in like black rubber. And that black rubber was so freaking hot. Like me just standing there, this is the south side of the house and you could just feel the heat just radiating off the roof. So interestingly enough, when there's a nest built on a window, you can actually see into the nest. So they, they don't build the envelope all the way around the back side of the comb. So you can see the comb there and the layers of envelope. So that's what I'm gonna to try to recreate when I relocate this nest. So they had a probably, I don't know, maybe 50 workers inside of there. And I wanted to keep as many of the workers as I possibly could. When you relocate a colony, if you don't have any workers, your larvae are gonna die, the queen's gonna leave, and the nest is gonna fail. And that, by extension, the relocation fails. So what I do is I trap as many inside the actual nest as I possibly can. So I put a piece of duct tape over the entranceway and then I, that way just traps any in but also keeps any from coming back in unfortunately from foraging. And then I just take this black trash bag and just wrap it around as tight as I possibly can without squishing the comb and pull it down really fast. So I take it down and put it right into a cooler that I have that has some ice in the bottom. That way it can keep them cool so they don't get overheated on the drive home. It's about a 35 minute drive home. So you see there's foragers coming back. They're obviously looking for the nest. I leave the envelope on the glass and that way it gives them something to kind of crawl on and look for the nest. If I took everything off, they would fly all around that window and it would be really difficult to vacuum up the last few that come back. So now that I had been kind of uh, cleaning up there for a while, I, I put the, um, I just basically just taped the nozzle of the vacuum right to where the entranceway used to be and then just let it sit for probably about 15, 20 minutes. And that way any foragers that are coming back will just get vacuumed up and uh, don't have to uh, worry about there being any residual left over for the client. So even though this is a roof right here that I'm walking on and stuff, um, there is a little like balcony deck-like thing that they have on the one side that comes out a doorway. So they do like to sit out there, so I wouldn't want to leave any adults flying around. So I got up as many as I possibly could and I just take a rag and just try to clean off as much of the remaining residual envelope as I can. It's always good to leave the area nice and clean. Um, allows clients to, uh, to appreciate your hard work and your um, interest to keep their property looking nice. Nice. Looks spotless. They call me Mr. Clean. Alright, so once I get this back to my house, so the cooler has a little bit of ice in the bottom of it and then the bag that has the nest in it. So once I start pulling that out, even though the wasps are kind of cool, they're flying out, but they're flying real slow and just they have no idea where they are. So they kind of stay in the area because they can sense the queen's pheromone. They know where the nest is. So they kind of fly around me for a while um, until I'm able to get the, the nest up onto that piece of wood. Um, what I don't want to have happen is I don't want the queen to leave. The colony will still survive if the queen leaves, but it'll become a male colony because all the workers will lay eggs and worker eggs become males. So what I'm doing here is I'm using a little bit of the envelope that have some workers on it and I'm trying to get them to jump from the envelope back over to the comb. So I shimmy it around a little bit, get them to fly off, they, they sense the comb, but then I do notice something in the envelope, the queen. The queen is still in the envelope. So I try to kind of like flick her out. Well, watch my right hand. She jumps out, crawls across my hand, and out she goes. Flies around, does a big circle. Oh, come back. I was devastated. Come back. Like a toddler. Come back. And I wave a little bit. This little wave. Goodbye, my old friend. And I salute you, my queen. <laughs> 
Oh, it's so disappointing. But she flew out, and I noticed that she dropped a little bit of uh, fluid. So she had a pheromone marker, and then she circled around three or four times before she took off. So I knew she was marking where she was. She knew the comb was there. So I just continued to try to get the, uh, the adults to go to the nest. Well, as you can see, directly center, that's the queen. So this is the next day. She came back to the envelope, or came back to the comb. So I was super stoked with that. So I'm getting this shot here. This was from um, the second day that they were on there, and they already started laying envelope on the nest, which is freaking awesome. So there was a lot of adults. I was excited also that I was able to maintain this many of adults in the relocation. That's the queen there, right there in the center. You can tell her from her large stripes. She has larger bands of stripes on her, and her um, body is obviously longer and more robust. All right, something to take notice here. This one here on the left flies out, goes to the camera, banks on it, and then flies back to the nest on the right-hand side, then takes off again, then all these other ones start swarming. I don't know at what point they decided to swarm. You can rewind that as many times to try to figure it out, but... It is unbelievable to me that they are able to fly out, come back, and within a split second, make the signal for the swarm to attack. So now they're attacking my cameras. I have two microphones up, two cameras, and they are just bouncing off of both of those, or all four of those uh, items. And they were like nestled into the, uh, into the microphone and everything. It was wild, wild to watch. And I actually didn't even know this was happening. I had the camera set up for a little while and then I came back out to, to uh, check on everything, and I saw them swarming, so I had to put my suit back on and uh, go out there and, and, uh, and rescue my cameras and microphones. I cannot believe how much... I cannot believe how much they've added to this nest. This is incredible. This is technically the third day, but they've only had really two days of being out here try to see how close I can get because they're kind of sensitive right now. Anytime the comb's exposed, they're going to be sensitive. They kind of swarm because of their own reflection in the window. But look at all that envelope. Yesterday I filmed and there was barely any envelope on the top of the comb. They are doing so incredibly well. This is freaking awesome. The last couple nests that I've done like this, it took them maybe four days, five days to get this level of envelope. But there's also a lot more on this and the queens on there. But when I was putting the comb up here initially, the queen was actually trapped in the original envelope that had torn off. And she, uh, the queen actually flew off but she did a couple orientation circles around where she took off from. So, and she also dropped some pheromone, um, a, a pheromone marker. That's actually her, the bottom left of the comb here. People ask how you can tell the queen. The queen has a more robust figure and she also has darker, thicker stripes. So what I'm hoping happens is that they start laying the envelope or the um, the comb closer to the window and eventually having the envelope wrap around the comb but doesn't wrap all the way around past the window so that way I can look from the window side and see them from the inside is what I hope happens it's just really cool I'm so happy that they're putting more envelope on more as it develops everybody
All right, so this is another bald face hornet nest, and this one was kind of nestled into this wineberry bush, which made it not a very good candidate to be relocated. Um, so I went in with the scissors and just wanted to trim it out kind of gently as possible to try to maintain as many in there without making them swarm. Uh, but I kind of figured they were probably going to end up swarming. So I just tried to snip off this one branch just as a trial, and boom, they came swarming out in a hurry. So um, I decided just to vacuum them up the best that I could. Um, so once I got this nest home, I was able to cut it open, and there was no queen inside. So either the adults had mutinized against her, or she had escaped while I was uh, while I was cutting this thing up. But it was probably the former rather than the latter. Um, bald faced hornets are kind of known to, to mutinize against their queen for whatever reason. So just snipping it out the best I could. I even saved a couple little wineberry patches for myself for later for a little snack, which was nice. And as you can see, the wineberries are missing here. <laughs> um, for those of you who have seen my channel before, I've explained um, the different structures of the nest um, in, in several of my videos. But for those of you who are new, I'm going to explain that again for you guys. Um, so what I'm cutting into here is the conical shape of the nest, which is actually a paper envelope. And this paper envelope is created by the wasps themselves. So the adult wasps will fly out and they will chew on dead decaying uh, wood matter and they will chew and extract the cellulose off the surface of that wood, mix it with their saliva, fly back to the nest, and regurgitate it into making this paper. It'll be like a little bead of like uh, a goo, and then as it starts to dry, they start mashing it with their mandibles to flatten into paper. So all of that you're seeing there is made by one individual wasp making one little tiny strip at a time and making this massive piece of paper. So once the paper envelope is off, you see that what's left, and it's called the comb. And the comb is literally just a cluster of, um, of cellulose material that is made into hexagonal little holes. And that allows for the queen to lay her egg into, those, into each one of those holes. And each one of those holes is called a cell. So as the egg hatches, it hatches into, an, into a larva. So what you're seeing here, these little quote-unquote worm-like things are called larvae. They're not really worms. They're not eggs. They're not uh, maggots. They are uh, wasp larvae. So this one here started to regurgitate a fluid because I kind of poked it with my tweezers. And what that actually simulated to her was that I was an adult wasp. See, larvae eat solid food, but the adult wasps cannot eat solid food. So the adult wasps will fly out, catch insects, flies, Japanese beetles, aphids, etc. And they will chew up that meat from that insect, fly it back, and feed it to the larvae. The larvae can eat solid food, and then they will digest that bug or plant matter or uh, meat or whatever that the adults bring back for them. And then they will regurgitate a clear fluid, which is actually the only thing that the adult wasp can eat besides, like, uh, flower nectar. So it's a give and take. The adult wasps feed the larva, and the larva feed the adults. So... So each one of these larvae that you're seeing are going through a different stage of development. Um, if you look deep down inside the cells, you can see these little tiny dots in there. And those are the eggs. And then those eggs develop into larvae. And then when the larvae are large enough and ready and mature enough, they will then weave a silk cap on their cell. And that's what you're seeing here. Those white bulbous pieces on top of the, the comb itself are called silk caps. The larva, once they're ready to go into their metamorphosis state to go in, to turn into an adult wasp, will weave that silk cap, and that closes them in there like a cocoon or an acrysalis for a butterfly. So once they're underneath the, the protection of that silk cap, they will start going through the metamorphosis. And as you can see here, I'm, I pulled off a lot of the silk caps to expose the different stages of metamorphosis. The one that I'm tweezing right now is pretty close to becoming an adult wasp. She probably had about maybe another four to five days before she would finally become an adult wasp. Her wings had just started developing. And the same with this one. This one was a little bit um, not quite developed as that last one, but it, it, it was definitely uh, it definitely had a lot of keratin on its body, which is like the hard um, plasticky-ish material that they get on their bodies as like an armor or an exoskeleton as it's called. So you can tell which ones are, as far as like the pupating adults are concerned, you can tell which ones are further along in development than the others because the, the lighter brown their eyes are, the, um, the earlier on in development they are. If they don't even have the eyes yet, then that means that they're really, they probably just weave their silk caps.
So I tweeze out a lot of these nests. Um, the ones that I'm trying to keep as far as nests are concerned, I don't want the chickens pecking them and pulling them out. Um, but for this case, I'm just doing it for uh, demonstration. So that's a small larva, another smaller but bigger larva. And then this one started developing its eyes, so it was under a silk cap. This one started developing legs. This one's eye was pretty developed and is pretty black. This one is getting starting to get keratin, and then the last one has its keratin. So this is the different stages of development for the adult wasp. All right, since I'm going to be feeding these to my chickens, I pulled out as many of the larvae as I wanted to, and decided just to pick them up and put them into this jar, which made it a little bit easier to uh, transport them out. The larvae do not bite. You cannot feel anything if you touch your finger on their mandibles. It doesn't hurt. It's only meant for, their mandibles are really only meant for for chewing up um, already mechanically soft uh, meat, insect meat. They can't cut through your skin. They don't have a stinger. The only time they develop their stinger is towards the very last thing in their development as a uh, pupating adult. Even once the pupating adults emerge as actual adults, they can't fly or sting for up to two days. <laughs> Ginger. All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to check out this video. If you guys enjoyed this content, drop in the comments and let me know what you think. If you have any suggestions for future videos or something you'd like to see me cover in an upcoming video, also drop in the comments and let me know. If you guys haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so and hit that bell notification down below. That way you guys get an update anytime I do post a video. All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to check out this video and supporting my channel, and I'll catch you guys on the next video.